uh, record on this computer. Okay, it says that it's recording. Okay, I can assume the same. So, uh, congratulations for being uh, the first uh, long-term member at the Simon Center. Thank you. Uh, very well deserved. Uh, we have a few questions for you. Great. Or, uh, just five questions. It should not take too long, but it would be nice if you could uh, address those. Say what should be you. So the first question, so when and why did you get interested in physics? I got interested in physics in high school, around like um, say junior year, I would say. So I was interested in math for a long time, but in, in high school, math was uh, somewhat easy and I had a physics teacher who uh, whenever he uh, he had a good day he he taught really challenging things and asked really challenging problems and uh, basically it was the challenge that that physics and the like yeah the challenge that physics problems posed uh, were, was what got me interested in physics and then I I think the the book by Brian Greene uh, that um, the elegant universe the elegant universe came out or I don't know if it came out at that time or not but my uh, mom's boss who was an American got, brought it for me in English so I read it uh, around that that time and that that was really uh, fascinating got me really interested in. Uh, fundamental physics and then I started reading popular books. How did you uh, know English at that point? Say it again? What, how did you know English at that point? Well, uh, yeah, I I knew enough English to read read that book, I would say. Uh, I learned English at school and, uh, and in after school programs. Uh, yeah, by that time I, I was pretty good in English. Mm -hmm. Especially reading, not not really speaking, but reading. Mm -hmm. And then you went to participate in the Physics Olympiad, right? Yes, yeah. So, I mean, the challenging problems led to... Uh, the Physics Olympiads are, are taken very seriously in Hungary. So there, there was some... Um, every week there was some preparation. It was actually in my high school, but for all Budapest. So everybody who was interested in physics problems came uh, to this uh, um, this after school uh, club uh, people even from Slovakia came uh, for for that two hour club every week uh, from the Hungarian speaking parts of Slovakia so it was really a big deal um, so they took the train for like I don't know two hours just to to participate in this club and there, there were really fun problems. Uh, uh, not really Olympiad style, like more, more tricky problems. Because Olympiad problems are kind of boring and long. And uh, well, nowadays they used to be also short and tricky, but now they're boring and long. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, but but these these ones were the really fun ones, like Russian style or Hungarian style tricky ones. Uh, and then we always got the long problem sheet that you had to solve for next week. And then somebody presented it and it was a lot of fun. So there was, there was these preparations for the Olympics throughout the years. And uh, so I, I did it for two years. Uh, and th that's how I learned physics, really. In, I mean, on the high school level. Yeah. Well, do you remember some particular puzzles from that time that yeah, you still think were beautiful or worth sharing? Uh, we're saying, oh, I, but I might not remember the solution. Uh, That's fine. The <laughs> listeners can look for the solution. Yeah, I, I, we can look up the solution. It was, um, yeah, one that was really fun was to estimate, um, like give give a dimensional analysis uh, type of. Uh, uh, 
uh, equation for the time and hourglass, so sand in an hourglass. Uh, um, yeah, the time time it takes as as a function of different parameters of an hourglass, uh, so that the hourglass counts. Right. That one was like you know it's it's a question that um, uh, you know it seems like so hard that it's amazing that you can answer it based on dimensional analysis. There seems to be so many parameters, but somehow. Uh, yeah, if you if you take the dependence, and the, I I think the trick is that in the, the solution I remember the trick I don't remember everything that that you should neglect the size of the the sand grains. Mm, uh, important. So that, so in the in your dimensional analysis, you shouldn't include that. Uh, Doesn't that stop mattering? Yes. Yeah. I see. Very nice. So, in your more uh, recent career, you have uh, written some uh, seminal papers on uh, the connections between some ideas in condensed matter physics, like quantum criticality and uh, black holes, and various kinds of black holes and stuff like that. So, can you tell us a little bit about what are the most important lessons from that work that you've done for black hole physics? And what are the most important lessons for condensed matter physics? Yeah, so so the underlying ideology behind much of my work uh, is to use uh, uh, ADS-CFT or gauge gravity duality, which is an exact equivalence between gravitational theories and strongly com correlated uh, quantum many-body systems. Um, and so the 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 idea behind applying this framework to problems in in strongly coupled physics is that you ask what kind of phenomena are generic uh, in the gravitational system, which might provide uh, interesting or surprising um, uh, dynamical phenomena in in the in in the in the many body language. Um, and so my work on quantum criticality and black holes uh, was driven by the realization that there are um, very generic black holes in uh, in, in string theory, uh, which have a certain kind of geometry. And this geometry uh, implies um, uh, some exotic phenomena in uh, predicts some exotic phenomena in strongly coupled systems. Uh, for example, uh, scaling symmetry in the time direction, but um, but fairly local physics in space. So we are used to critical points wh where space and time uh, play uh, similar roles, and uh, in these kind of examples. Uh, it's it's very dissimilar it's uh, uh because in time you have uh, very long correlations but in space very short and uh, such phenomenological models have been written down in condensed matter before uh but but that this is so generic uh in in gravity um was a realization uh, that we made and uh we speculated that this character this represents some uh, universal intermediate energy fluid like phase um, or liquid like phase uh, of matter that that might be uh, might be somewhat generic in strongly coupled systems what is the gravitational dual of this uh, so these are ads2 throats uh, with some transfer space um, and these have, I mean, this work I've I've done in in the early 2010s, and so uh, recently the correlations are local in space, so you can reduce some space, and it's just quantum mechanics. Yeah, so it's but it's quantum. I mean, the way the physics works is that kind of you get so the in the time direction, the scaling exponents are are dependent on the wave number in the transfer space, so it's somewhat dependent on okay yeah so it's 
it's the the way you to visualize it is kind of these clusters uh, next to each other that are only um, uh, coupled in in some um, way that that the correlation length is finite so that's it's almost individual clusters but they still talk to each other it's like a stack of stacks of things in space yes uh -huh. Yeah, and so, but but these these kind of AD, so the ADS two physics kind of made a reappearance recently in the in the context of this SYK model, um, and uh, so a good model of of these uh, phases would be to consider SYK models coupled to each other in in some spatially local way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've I've been following this recent work on. On ADS two because of my past uh, with 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 these phases. Mm -hmm. So more recently, you also contributed a lot of work to this subject that goes by the name of TT bar deformations. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about why that's interesting and what are the main questions in that field? So there are two uh, reasons uh, somewhat independent uh, why TT bar is interesting. Um, one is that it provides uh, one of the or the first example known to me um, where you uh, start from a, a long distance infrared description of physics um, and then you prescribe then you uh, learn a little bit uh, of the remnants of the UV physics and the technical term is the, you know what irrelevant operator appears in the low energy long distance effective action and just from this information uh, you can reconstruct uh, the microphysics and learn about what the ultraviolet behavior of the system is um, and this would be completely nonsense uh, or completely uh, out of question in the one of the familiar examples of uh, of of a non-trivial um, well, well I can use the word renormalization group flow and then we can explain it better um, where for example in in quantum chromodynamics in the theory of strong interactions uh, at long distances, we have some uh, theory of mesons and perhaps hadrons, and it and in terms of those degrees of freedom, it seems completely unlikely that you would be able to uh, describe the microphysics of quarks and gluons. But in in TT bar, at least in one way of thinking about it, is that just knowing the infrared degrees of freedom and that that you are working with this very special theory you can learn about the microphysics mm -hmm. well, in some sense what people did in real life was that they observed hadrons and baryons hadrons mesons baryons eh? and they reconstructed the quartz so they sort of actually did that well but then they had to they didn't just analyze they didn't just do very low energy experiments they to discover the partons they really had to go to high well i know that they hypothesized yeah, hypothesis uh, based on low energy experiments yes that is correct yeah. but then the dynamics of quarks and gluons was really only revealed by uh, by high energy scattering yes is that fair I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's one reason for why TT bar is interesting. And the other reason is again coming from this uh, connection between uh, gravitational systems and strongly coupled systems. Um, and and the, there uh, with Lauren McGaw and uh, Herman Ferlinde, uh, we made a proposal for what the gravitational dual. Uh, gravitational equivalent description uh, of the TT bar deformation uh, might be uh, in in 
two dimensional boundary theories, three dimensional pure gravity, and uh, uh, the 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 prescription is that you uh, cut implement a sharp cutoff on the on the bulk geometry at some finite distance and impose Dirichlet boundary conditions, and this uh, prescription. Uh, produces gravitational physics that is mirrored in the uh, field theory in in this TT bar deformed uh, field theories. And so that has uh, so uh, an important challenge in in quantum gravity is to try to uh, so we have this very nice holographic theory of quantum gravity, uh, but it's very hard to reconstruct local gravitational physics from it. Mm -hmm. And so this is um, an interesting step in the direction where you can uh, kind of detach yourself from uh, from the asymptotic boundary and and uh, study more local bulk physics. And there are um, so this has generated a lot of interest in the field, and people are trying to exploit this new kind of way of thinking about local bulk physics that it's a deformation of the boundary theory by an irrelevant operator. Mm -hmm. So the bulk physics doesn't exist before you do the deformation? Or what's the statement? The no, it, it does exist. It's, it's encoded in, uh, I mean, in, in very non-locally in the boundary degrees of freedom. And by doing this deformation, you kind of ca can, can make the coding, coding somewhat simpler. Ah, so you're saying that the holographic information is encoded more obviously. Yes. Mm -hmm. Relevant deformation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very nice. One last question. Do you have any advice for researchers at your age and stage uh, of how to uh, work out the work-life balance and especially if people have little kids? Can you share with us your experience because you've been uh, tremendously as they say nowadays productive so maybe you can share with us your experience of how to strike a healthy life work balance and family life and remain well, i mean i mean if if you look at my pattern of publications then you will notice that my when my son was born then it went down drastically for for at least half a year uh, and then then it kind of picked up again uh, and so some of my recent productivity is basically just project that projects that are that were started before my son was born and uh, that are just being finished i mean one important advice is not to kill yourself and uh, take i mean as probably every uh, uh, parent knows uh, the first half a year is is usually you are just a zombie so you shouldn't uh, you can't do much about it uh, you should accept it and uh, and when you get your energy levels back that you can catch up uh, I mean one one nice thing in in theory is that even if you miss some time some months half a year uh, you can get back into it. It's not like working in a lab where your m mice die or uh, your bacteria don't evolve or something. It's it's very easy to get back into research. Um, yeah, and the other thing that was very helpful for me is to start working more extensively with collaborators who are perhaps younger, perhaps students who have you who can who can do some calculations that you would also be able to do but not but you don't have enough time for so for me it was i think broadening a little bit uh, with the the pool of people that i collaborate with uh was certainly helpful um yeah you seem to have collaborated extensively recently with some students at stony brook so yeah. you found that useful yes i found that very useful for <coughs> for this reason uh, yeah, I mean, I think I have enough experience that I can uh, see what problems are feasible and then uh, they can be extremely useful in, in figuring out the details, for sure. And there are some excellent students in Stony Brook, so uh, 
uh, it's it's very helpful yes very very good so thanks so much for the interview thank you okay